for our comp research academy or, or COBRA. Um, uh, we had a great group of, of scholars. Uh, I'm really, really proud of what they accomplished here in this really short seven weeks. It might seem like a long time, but scientifically, it, it's, it's pretty short, and it's really remarkable what they can do uh, in that short amount of time. Uh, it's no small feat to put together a program like this, too. It's not just the seven weeks. We start way early uh, to get uh, things rolling. Uh, and there's really a lot of people I'd, I'd like to thank now, just to take some time to, to thank. Um, a special acknowledgement to our uh, now outgoing department chair, Yvette Bahar, who uh, in, well, several years ago, um, helped us establish this program and really supported it throughout, too. Uh, she's not with us anymore. She's moved on to a different position, but uh, I still like to thank her um, for supporting this, as with our current interim chair, Jeremy Berg, uh, who's, uh, again, continue that tradition of uh, support for the program. Um, I'd like to thank our, my co-director, uh, Dr. David Coase, uh, for his help in, in planning and doing a lot of the teaching and, and taking so many students to uh, every summer. Uh, David, thank you. Um, special thanks also to, to Emily Hayhurst uh, for her help in coordinating the program uh, and the other CSB staff members, Jenkins and Ashton, who are online uh, for all their technical help and everything else. Uh, this is Emily's first summer with us, uh, and she ran two programs, an undergrad program and this one, and did a really terrific job. So thank you, Emily. Um, we're going to hear this a lot today, but uh, thank you to the mentors that uh, spent so much time with, with our students this summer, um, you know, providing the research experience for them. Uh, really, they're the essence of, of this program. We would not be able to do it without the dozens of mentors that uh, volunteer their time throughout the Hillman Academy. You'll hear a lot more about mentors uh, later in the session today, too. Uh, parents and family members that, that are here uh, and friends, thank you for supporting uh, your kids and sharing them with us uh, this summer. They're not really kids anymore. They're really growing up fast, I'm sure. Um, and uh, I think they did the same this summer, too. They really grew a lot scientifically. Uh, they participated in a unique program working at the, the cutting edge of biomedical research. Uh, and I think it's really going to position them well for their uh, future goals, be it in science, medicine, uh, or other fields, too. Uh, or if nothing else, when they're asked the question, what did you do this summer? And, you know, and just worked on curing cancer and that, so no big deal. Um, you should be very proud of their accomplishments. We, we definitely are. Uh, lastly, I'd like to thank our, our scholars, our COBRAs. Um, thank you for being such ladies and gentlemen this summer, uh, for conducting yourselves with, with probity. Uh, and that's a good GRE word if, if you're not aware of that, but that's uh, uh, on the way out, apparently. Uh, for all of your hard work, which you know, really paid off, and as we're going to see in these presentations today, too. So uh, I look forward to the presentations today and for the many great things that lie ahead for, for all of you also. So uh, with that, we will start uh, today's program, and uh, we'll have Dr. Coase introduce the first group of students presenting. Thank you. Why don't you get set up? Um, my pleasure to introduce uh, Caleb, Ruth, and Katima. So Caleb's from Elizabeth Township. Uh, Ruth's just down the street in SciTech. Uh, and Katima is actually a returning student. She was here last year, and for some reason, she decided to come back. Uh, but she uh, graduated high school. She's now at Penn, which is why she's remote, uh, which is kind of exciting. Uh, so I'll say my philosophy on this is just sort of throw people into the deep end. Uh, and the fact that you're still breathing is quite the accomplishment. Uh, uh, and uh, I also like having a group of students because that way you can help each other uh, prevent uh, yourself from sinking. And I was thinking about this project actually this morning. And uh, back, uh, thank you. That's cool. <laughs> uh, back when I was in high school, I think most of this project was impossible. We didn't have the structure of the SIP. We certainly didn't have alpha fold. Even if we had all of that, if you try to run it on the computers when I was in high school, you'd still be waiting for the result. Uh, so this is uh, actually, uh, when I think about it in the context of when I was in high school, this is pretty amazing work. And I, I hope you learn something. And please ask them a question at the end. Uh, thank you. So for our research this summer, we computationally structured a model of a protein that is a potential cancer drug product target, I mean. Okay, so SIP for F11 is the potential drug target. It's also known as cytochrome 
P450 for F11. And CYP for F11 is a part of the super family of enzymes CYP450. And their function is to biosynthesize um, steroids and help with drug metabolism. But CYP for F11 is overexpressed in lung cancer, colon cancer, and ovarian cancer. And it may be linked to tumor growth. For our project, we're more worried about uh, why it's overexpressed in lung cancer. There's no known cause on why it's overexpressed in lung cancer, but it could be due to what happens to the substrates when it binds to CYP4F11. And drugs could be designed to inhibit CYP4F11 to treat lung cancer. But to do that, the structures must be known. And currently, there is no known structure of CYP4F11. So proteins are made of long sequence of amino acids. And those amino acids help determine how the protein folds and gets a shape which determines its function. And to make sure to know really what the protein looks like, it should be experimentally resolved. So our project is acting as a placeholder until we get those experimentally resolved results. So we, we want to know what is it for F11 structure and how do the substrates bind to it? So a, a enzyme is a protein that speeds up reactions in the body. And once a substrate binds to it, that's when the reaction happens. Usually this reaction helps regulate biological systems, but in CYPs for f 11 case, sometimes it can lead to cancer growth. So we all worked with our own substrates, arachidonic acid and heat 16, which is long and thin fatty acids. And we also worked with erythromycin, which is a large antibiotic. Knowing how these three different substrates that have different um, structures bind to sit for F11 will help us determine its shape. The substrate I researched was ar arachidonic acid, the long fatty acid. Arachidonic acid on its own isn't related to lung cancer or anything, but when arachidonic acid, this is what looks like, binds to sit for F11, it gets metabolized in terms of 20 heat, this subset. Uh, 20 heat is involved in a lot of processes related to uh, the circulatory and renal systems. And one of those processes is the growth of blood vessels. So uh, by, so heat 20 in cancer cells allows blood vessels to grow to the tumors, allowing them to grow and proliferate. So the substrate I worked on is HET16, and this is a chemical structure of HET16. Uh, HET16 is an inhibitor, and it inhibits the formation of 20 heat. And uh, it even uh, has a high selectivity at um, high concentrations. So when it's at high concentrations, it won't affect other enzymes functions. And HET16 preventing CYP or F11 from metabolizing other substrates into 20 heat is beneficial because 20 heat is known to be a vasoconstrictor in the cerebrum and it reduces blood flow in the cerebrum. Your cerebrum is responsible for high cognitive activity like thinking and memory. 20 heat is also known to inhibit sodium and water transport to your kidneys. So the substrate that I was assigned to is known as erythromycin. And here is an image um, on the right of its chemical configuration. So erythromycin is, as mentioned before, is a drug or antibiotic that prevents the increase of cancer cells and induces apoptosis or the death of cells with high HERG channel expression. And it's related to the CYP4F11 enzyme because CYP4F11 metabolizes erythromycin and acts as a catalyst for it. And erythromycin is also known as the most efficient substrate for the CYP for F11 enzyme. Next slide. And here is the process that was done in order to efficiently and successfully generate a model of the CYP for F11 enzyme. So the first step that we um, had to take to achieve our research goal was to download the CYP for F11's amino acid sequence. Next slide. 
to do this, we used a website called Uniprot that allowed us to look at the amino acid sequence for the CYP for F11 enzyme and then download it. Next slide. The next step of the process was to compare similar structures of the CYP for F11 enzyme. Next slide. To do this, we input the downloaded sequence into a system that is known as Protein Blast, which allowed us to compare the amino acid sequences of other structures and find ones that were the most similar to that of the CYP for F11 enzyme. This is an example of one of the few most similar structures to the CYP for F11's amino acid sequence that we had looked at. Although the PDB database gave us a lot of important information about the similar structures, the main thing that we were looking for in the database was first, the structure's query coverage, which is how much of the query aligns to the target. Of that percentage sequence identity or percentage identity is how many residues are the same. Although Protein Blast tells us that these structures are most similar to CYP for F11, I would however like to point out that a 43% percentage identity is not very good. The last thing that we have looked at look for was the similar structures accession code or PDB code. After finding the similar structures, we then searched for them and downloaded them on Uniprod. Next slide. The next step in our process was visualizing the structures as 3D figures. Next slide. In this step of the process, after we had identified the similar structures and downloaded them, we uploaded them to PyMol, which is a molecular visualization system that allowed us to compare these similar structures, protein structures, to the CYP4 F11 enzyme three-dimensionally. And here's an example of what a PyMol, social, PyMol session would look like. The blue-looking ribbon is one of the similar the similar structures that was previously downloaded. Specifically, it is what CYP4 F11 will look like bound to the substrate erythromycin. The green ribbon is one of the many structures that we generated using the program AlphaFold, which I will expand on within the next few slides. And on the far right of the screen shows the various structures that were uploaded to PyMol, but only two of them are present on the screen. And you can tell this by the light highlight on their files. Next slide. And as I had mentioned previously, in our next step, we generated ensembles of the similar structures. Next slide. We then use the AlphaFold program to generate structures to the CYP for F11 enzyme. However, because AlphaFold only generates a limited number of structures, we wrote a script that would generate an ensemble of them, which would then allow us to have a larger selection of structures to pick the best fitting ones for our substrate. With AlphaFold, we could rank the structures by accuracy and balance the diversity of the structures to produce an ensemble. And here's an individual of what an ensemble that generated alpha fold structures looks like with each color representing a different, a generated, a different generated structure. We additionally calculated the RMFS or root mean square fluctuation calculations of each structure, which is how much of a particular residue moves or fluctuates during a simulation. So, next slide. So, once we had an ensemble, we began working on uh, figuring out how our specific substrates dock into those structures. So, the, so AlphaFold generates a protein, but it doesn't generate a substrate. So, uh, to to uh, to figure out how our substrates may bind into these structures, we use something called molecular docking. Uh, that's where we use a, pro a program to try and figure out how a substrate might configure into it. Uh, we did this for uh, a lot of, for all models that we got in our ensemble. So each of them had like a different, it was a very, our ensemble was very varied. So a lot of them had different uh, like real levels of realism and confidence. So as you can see here, uh, for one of our most accurate ones, the post score is, Zero point eight, and so that and that gets up to one, so it's pretty good. Uh, but for some of our other proteins, our post score was as low as zero point two or so. So this is what our proteins look like with the line and dock with the substrate dock inside them. You can see that there's uh like structures within the center of them compared to one where it wasn't thought where that pocket is previously just annotated.
So what did we get from all this? This right here is a model of CIP4B1, one of the closest experimentally resolved structures that we found. Uh, it was, so CIP4B1 was a pretty good analog to CIP4F11, but there were a few issues. There are experimentally resolved structures of CIP4B1 found to HET16, which is useful because it's well for substrates for studying, and of a found to octane, which even though it isn't one of the substrates we're looking into, it's still quite useful. Octane has a very similar structure to arachidonic acid. It's almost like a shorter version of it. Uh, and there was no crystal structure or experimentally resolved one of CIP4B1 found to erythromycin or anything analogous to it. Um, so our results from generating the model, we, we found that from a alpha pulp works by taking an input and producing an output. The output is our models, uh, but the input is uh, both uh, reference experimentally resolved structures and CYP4F11's amino acid sequences. AlphaFold takes small sections of CYP4F11's amino acid, maybe like five out of the 500 or so that make it up, and uses that along with templates to produce a prediction. Uh, so because CYP4, because AlphaFold takes an input and produces an output, we're able to change that input to get a different output. Uh, we changed the, the samples that AlphaFold was using. Uh, by lowering it quite a bit, you were able to get these types of models that are very different than our experimentally resolved structure. As you can see, they're coming apart a lot further. Uh, but these structures aren't super realistic. They aren't how proteins normally look. Uh, but by, and, uh, by increasing the MSP, we were able to get these sorts of structures, which you can see are very uh, similar to sit 4 v one and tightly and tightly uh, folded together. Uh, however, they're all pretty similar. The high MSA ones, the high sample ones, that is. Uh, this is how uh, similar and different they are represented, represented quantitatively. This is the uh, root mean square fluctuations of the low MSA. Uh, RMSF is essentially how much the protein structure is deviating on average. The red represents a higher deviation and the blue a lower one. As you can see with a low MSA, it's almost entirely red, especially around the center where the substrate binds. That's quite useful to, to us because it's giving us a lot of possibilities, especially when it comes to the part of the protein we are studying. Um, but looking at the RMSF of a of the IMSA section, you can see it's almost entirely blue. They're near, there's nearly no deviation. They're all basically identical. Uh, and even though they're all pretty much identical, they're still kind of useful because they give us a very realistic and confident representation of how protein might fold. Uh, so now that we had, so I take, so after we took our ensemble and docked our substrates to it, uh, we got a few more realist, a few more uh, potential models of what it looks like with a docked substrate. Uh, so this is one of our CIP4F11 models represented differently than the previous ones. We're showing its surface instead of uh, its the coils of its amino acids. As you can see right here, the, the uh, green part is our substrate, it's, which is lying on the surface of CIP4F11. Uh, and this is lying, so normally proteins would go inside of the, so normally substrates would go inside the protein and dock within that. Uh, but here we can see our substrate is docking on top of it. Uh, this may be, this may be how the substrate docks, or it may not. Uh, substrates can dock onto the surface of proteins, as which, uh, sit, and sit 4 f 11 does do that. Uh, but it may also just be that the in, that uh the inner inner cavity of the protein isn't realistic and isn't allowing the substrate to dock.
Uh, some models didn't have it docked on the surface. They had it docked correctly. Uh, this is one of those. As you can see, there's no substrate for anything on its surface. Uh, but if we stop looking at the surface and look at uh, its ribbons, we can see that inside of it, there is a, there's a substrate dock in the center. Uh, that's really good. It's how proteins and substrates dock uh, when come non allosterically that, be, that being just not on the surface. So these dock, so the docking we got was uh, superior to the previous models. Uh, here's generally what previous models of SIP for F11 looked like. They're pretty similar to ours when it comes to structure, but they didn't have uh, anything inside that cavity because they were just generated normally without fold, without any additional work. Um, so ours are show a lot more about SIP for F11 when it comes to substrate docking, uh, which can clue us in more on how SIP for F11 is binding to these proteins. Uh, so then, so if so, until SIP for F11 is experimentally resolved, what we have now is uh, basically the best model of it. Uh -huh. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. David Coase, our mentor, uh, Dakota and Andrew from his lab, along uh, and Dr. Simone Brixius, one of our collaborators who is working on experimentally resolving SIP for F11, along with uh, the managers of the Hillman Academy. Hey, we have plenty of time for questions. Open the floor to everybody, please. Thank you. Maybe, but um, when you talk about experimentally resolving OT structure, like what does that mean will be the result? Like something that visually looked like this or the actual sequence? I guess I'm not clear on uh, it. would be what it what the structure actually looks like. What we have right now is predictions. And how do they do that? Uh, so proteins are experimentally resolved by uh, generating a lot of them and then uh, trying to essentially look at them with a uh, really intense like crystal uh, x-ray machine, I think. Uh, and that's like a really uh, like time consuming and expensive process because of how like small the things you working you're working with are. Okay, so that means that all these computational models that you guys were able to use as input, that's the, that they had experimental results that you use as the basis then to like drop them computationally what this will look like. Yeah. Yeah, from different words, not the one again. And fun fact, the synchrotron is down once because there was a, an electrocution uh, at someone. We didn't die, but uh, so they're not going to be able to resolve this crystal structure for some time. Uh, this the national effort shut down about yesterday. Yeah. But the guy didn't die. <laughs> but, you know, science can be dangerous. <laughs> I, I feel like you should have superpowers if you're in a <laughs> so I have a question about the. You, so you mentioned at first that this was uh, applicable to lung cancer, and but it's also involved in other cancers. Is you know these findings or the future of these findings will those be applicable, or what's the difference? I guess what was lung cancer specific about this project? Uh, lung cancer was specifically. Uh... Dr. Simone Brixius, uh, Dr. Kosi's collaborator, was specifically investigating its link to lung cancer. I'm not sure how it relates to other cancers, but uh, one of the ones it, it uh, sit for F11 is overexpressed in is uh, ov ovarian cancer, uh, and sit for F11 is involved in the production of uh, estrogen. So you think if you found a, a potent inhibitor that, that docks well, that's functional, that, that could have an effect on these other cancers too? Uh, yeah, I would assume so. Other questions? I have 
one more about the ensemble. Um, so how do you generate an ensemble using the omnifold? It normally just gives you one structure. Do you have to do something different for the input or how uh, does that work? Yeah, we changed the input sampling and the uh, template sampling to, get, to allow us to get a different output each time we run it. Last chance. Let's thank our presenters again for a great job. Hey. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Great. Okay. Do you know the name of your slides? And then and presentation. I don't think it's a people. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Three hours. This one? Three hours. If you want to see it, go down. Where? Can you see it? What's your name on your project? <laughs> 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 and and the you turn in, three, hours okay. three hours ago? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, you so, can do that. Sorry. I have a lot of experience with this setup, so I know don't, don't jump the gun and start talking. <laughs> Um, so I'm Jim Fader, uh, and I'm Stephanie's uh, mentor for the summer. Um, I'm a professor here in the computational physical biology department, and my group does computational modeling of signal transduction. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, it's great to have Stephanie come and work with us. She's a rising sophomore at North Allegheny uh, this year. She came with a great background um, in science courses, computer science courses, and programming. Uh, and she had been involved in some uh, AI boot camp, which made us think that a great project would be to explore the latest and greatest thing in AI, which is large language models, uh, and to understand how we might use start to use this technology um, to build uh, better models of signal transduction. So much like we've seen with uh, AlphaFold giving us models of protein structure, we would like to use these large language models potentially to synthesize the huge amount of information we have about signaling networks uh, to make uh, large scale models of signal transduction. Networks. And so Stephanie's project is a first step in that direction. <clears throat> so for my research, I've been exploring ChatGPT's capability in analyzing and generating the model of biochemical kinetics. So what is biochemical kinetics? Biochemical kinetics examines the rates and mechanism of chemical reaction and studies how the concentrations of reactants and products change over time. Chemical reaction involves the conversion of reactant molecules into product molecules. And the rate of chemical reaction is how quickly the reactant molecules are being consumed and the products are being formed over time. So why is biochemical kinetics important and why should we study it? Um, so it plays a crucial role in uncovering molecular mechanisms in biology so this is a key understanding to um, how cells and organisms function at a molecular level. And um, molecular mechanisms include various functions like gene expression, um, signaling pathways, and cell cellular communications, and others. And it also improves medical and industrial fields, um, for example, like drug development, um, scientists can create a more effective medicine um, with fewer side effects by targeting a specific enzyme that deals with um, diseases. And it also provides an insight into um, disease mechanism. And it also contributes to scientific discoveries, benefiting um, a 
diverse fields of study. So the objective of my research is how capable is ChatGPT at generating and analyzing role-based models of biochemical kinetics? So what are role-based models? So role-based models are used to model biochemical kinetics. Um, as I mentioned before, biochemical kinetics is um, studying how the um, organisms function at a molecular level. And um, this model can um, help make a model of it. And um, it also uses a straightforward cause and effect approach. Um, so it's gonna give a specific condition, an event, and which leads to like a specific outcome. And this is also a fixed, um, fixed models, meaning that it cannot evolve to handle different tasks. It can only um, handle specific tax, tasks that were initially programmed to do. Um, so here are the two softwares I used for my research, ChatGPT and BioNetGen. ChatGPT is a large language model developed by OpenAI that can understand and generate human-like text based on the input it receives. And it has been trained on vast amount of data gathered from the internet to achieve this ability. And BioNetGen is a software tool used in computational system biology used for modeling and simulating biochemical reaction networks. It uses a special language called domain-specific language for defining rules and interactions. And um, there's another software that I use called VS Code. It doesn't really play a major part, but it connects with um, about NetGen, so it helps. Um, it, there are two separate networks that can work together to make um, coding tasks easier for scientists. And um, BioNetGen is an extension of VSCO. So what were the methods? Um, first, ChatGPT were given the syntax rules of BioNetGen language. Then um, we'll let it like comprehend what it is. And we'll ask it to generate a code which then can be run in BioNetGen to test if it works or not. So ChatGPT's first attempt of generating a BNGL code. So we first um, gave it syntax rules, then we asked it to generate a code of protein binding. Here was the code generated by ChatGPT, and there were like minor mistakes here. Um, so, a is the type of protein, we're specifying it in molecule types, and it should be binding with site, it shouldn't be binding with site A, since B, protein B is already binding with site A. And then here is also another um, small error. It's, um, we're saying like the initial concentration of the complex A and B is zero, but we shouldn't, we wouldn't want that. And here are just like some other small mistakes. So what did we do to fix this? We um, provided the method of the error for ChatGPT and we tell it what's wrong. And so this is the code generated afterwards um, after correcting itself. As we can see um, here, the um, A is now binding to site B, and the initial concentration is now of protein A and B instead of like the complex A and B. And then here are just some small differences, changes. And then um, to see if it works, we're going to test it out in BioNetGen again to see if it can run or not. And this was the graph that was generated. Um, so this doesn't seem like it's working. The blue line represent protein A, and over time it's just still, the concentration is still at 10,000. And then the orange line represents protein B, 
concentration was like less than a thousand throughout the whole time and the complex of a and b just stays the same so the process repeats until we can um generate we can generate a functional code here was chat gpt second attempt we gave it the syntax rules once again but this time we gave it an example of ligand receptor binding and asked it to generate a similar BNGL code. Here's how it's looked like. And as we can see, the um, blue line of ligand, ligand, ligand molecules decreases and over time it just stays here while the complex of ligand and receptor molecules are here and the green represent the receptors. So as like, so it's like the lines are like this because um, as the ligand and receptors are binding to make a complex, there's also dissociation rate at the same time that's like breaking up apart the molecules. So that's why they say it like this. And so on the left is the example code given to ChatGPT. Well, on the right is the code that was gen generated by generated from ChatGPT. Um, so here are some differences. Chat um, the example code uses T as um, the receptor and binds to the L site, while on the right, ChatGPT uses R to refer as um, the receptor and binds to two different sites. L and D for some reason. Um, and then here is just some, um, like the number of ligand receptors are like different, just switched backward, I guess. And and the dissociation rate is also different. But there's like just minor differences. And so the main point of our research is can ChatGPT understand BNGL by making one, making code? Um, so chat GBT may not be as reliable solely based on uh, syntax rules, but they can perform well if a, if an example was given prior for it to analyze. So some future direction includes determining the required training for that chat GBT to generate functional code and identify the most crucial and smallest set of instructions to achieve the highest performance. Here is my acknowledgement, the program itself, um, the program coordinators, my mentor, my grad student mentor, and the guy who worked at up my lab, and like other. Thank you. Did you try asking chat to generate things without giving the syntax rules? Uh yeah, at first. And it was just like it was just random, like it, it just couldn't run and it's like um it was like missing some things, parameters and stuff like that. So yeah, it didn't really work out. Um, yeah, so I was just basically, um, that's basically what I said. Yeah, just like explaining what's wrong. And I also got like mad at ChatGPT for like, not like generating like code. So I kind of like yelled at it. <laughs> <laughs> Your lesson on using chat for your homework. <laughs> no, that did not work. <laughs> did you have to uh, teach chat GPT to um, uh, learn the DSL language at first, or does it did it just know already? Um, no, I didn't teach it like so DSL. It just used it from, uh, from the internet or something, yeah. So <clears throat> So you did examples where it didn't get things quite right. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have an example which surprised you in a positive way? Like 
it has some insightful suggestion that would you know sort of suggest that it's but it, that it's sort of improving on the examples that it's been given. No, it's always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Any discussion? Okay, one more, Neil. Did you try out like different prompts to train the data? Like specifically the different keywords without like inputs down at all? No. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you have your question. Yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, so I'm Swapnil. I'm a second year PhD in Jishnu Das's lab, and I primarily work with Anna. So she's a high school student. She came with a background of coding, and she was very interested in uh, interested in implementation of uh, machine learning algorithms as well as learning more about network biology. So this project primarily is an interplay of all network biology, machine learning, as well as some sort of coding. Uh, so this data is something which uh, our collaborators generated, uh, particularly for B cells, which are like immune cells. So her work is primarily involving immune network biology. Uh, one thing which I really liked about Anna is uh, the way she has evolved over a seven weeks period where she became more and more independent and by the end of the internship. She was the one who was coming to me and telling me that how I directed things and all, which I really admire about her. Yeah, so off to her work, she'll present a uh, big title slide. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so over these past few weeks, I've been analyzing how B cells change between states by constructing a gene regulatory network and using, a, uh, and using simulated transcription factor perturbation. But before I get into all of this, I'd like to explain a more basic definition of what a network is. So... There are all sorts of networks that you see in like your everyday life. So networks are comprised of nodes and edges, and the nodes are like the individual parts that make up the network, and the edges are the interactions between these nodes. So for example, one type of network you might see is a social media network where the nodes would be the users, and the edges would be the interactions between the users. So like if you were chatting with someone on that. Another type of network that you might see is like an airplane network where the nodes would be the individual airports and the edges would be the different flights that like interact between nodes getting you from one place to another. But for my project, I was focusing on gene regulatory networks and in a GRM, the nodes are transcription factors in genes and the edges are regulatory are the regulatory interactions where, so for example, in this example, the transcription factor controls this gene being expressed. So overall, gene regulatory networks work to control the proteins in a cell, so like which proteins are actually expressed in a cell. And so this is an example of one of the interactions that might create a protein, but this is a far smaller example of a far larger network that could look something like this. And so I've been talking about transcription factors, but I haven't really explained them. So allow me to tell you more about that. So while there are a ton of genes present in the human genome, not every single one is expressed and not every single gene is made into a protein. So how this is controlled is by transcription factors and transcription factors, uh, transcription factors, um, can control basically like all of the proteins that are produced in your body. So like they might control the production of, uh, of like the acid in your stomach or something like that. So how they do this is in before a gene in the DNA, there's a section of non-coding DNA, which contains parts other than genes. So in this section, there's a binding site, which 
a transcription factor can attach to, and then that allows it to regulate the gene after it. So in this case, after the uh, after this transcription factor bound, the gene could be expressed. And it's important to note that transcription factors can only bind to open regions in DNA in the chromatin, and I'll explain a bit more about that later. So before I explain my data, I'd like to show. Uh, I'd like to say about my motivation. So overall, I wanted to learn how B cells would respond to antigens which should hopefully help with an insight into gene regulation as a whole and more of an understanding of how the immune system responds to diseases. So for this project, the data I used included data from different B cell states. So first of all, a B cell is a type of cell in the immune system that helps to fight off diseases by creating antibodies. But they don't start able to create antibodies. They start in a naive state where they haven't encountered any sort of disease. But once a disease is encountered, and specifically an antigen, which is the part that allows the B cell to create antibodies, is encountered, they go into an activated state where they're rapidly dividing. And from this activated state, they can go into three different states. So the first of this is the pre-GC state which acts as a sort of like transition state where from there they can turn into cells that, cre uh, that create more effective antibodies. And then there's the plasmablast state, which is a short-lived state that can create antibodies, but, they're, but either they are removed or they're transferred into the plasma cell state, which is longer lived and cre it creates more antibodies. And then there's the memory state, which allows the cell to store what what like antibodies have previously worked against diseases. And so for this project, the B cell data I got was from the naive, activated, pre-GC, and plasma blast states. And so within each of these states, there are different genes expressed that allow the cells to do different things. So for this reason, I needed to use a variety of different data regarding the genes. So the data I used for this was called single cell attack seq data and single cell RNA seq data. So, first of all, I needed to understand which regions were accessible for transcription factor binding and like which transcription factors could be in this overall B cell network. And the attack sequence data tells you about the accessibility of chromatin. So, like if it's wrapped around these histone proteins, then it wouldn't be able for the uh, for the transcription factor to bind. But if it's not then the transcription factor can't bind. However, just because a transcription factor could be bound to an area, it doesn't necessarily mean it is or that the genes after it, it are necessarily expressed. So the single cell RNA sequence data tells you about gene expression and that allows for the network to be like more accurate to what the cell is actually expressing. So I'd next like to transition and tell you more about my objectives for this project. So first of all, I wanted to model the gene and transcription factor connections within a B cell, and I would do that by creating the gene regulatory network. And then I'd like to simulate transcription factor perturbation. So in this case, it would be like knocking out a specific transcription factor that, that regulates a particular gene and seeing how that impacts all the different cells in their different states. And in the long term, this could hopefully be used to develop a computational toolkit that would give you more insights into immune uh, the immune system biology and specifically B cell biology. So to do this, I used a program called Cell Oracle. And Cell Oracle contains a six step workflow, which I'll now explain. So the first step is to construct a base gene regulatory network from the attack seq data. So this data would allow you to, put, to see all of the potential transcription factors that could be binding to uh, the to the DNA within the cell. But there, there is also the single cell RNA sequence data, which is needed. So this data allowed, allowed you to process it into clusters. And basically, the clusters would depend on which genes were expressed and as such, which types of cell they were based on like the genes expressed in each type of cell. So each of these clusters for in our data would be like a different B cell state. And then once you've done both of those, you can refine the base GRN with all the potential transcription factors 
with the single cell RNA seq data, and that allows you to have a more accurate GRN that would have like the genes and also all the genes that are expressed and the transcription factors that control them. So once this model was constructed, there were some analysis steps taken afterwards. First of all, network analysis was performed to give each of the genes a particular like, weight based on how much influence they have on the rest of the network. Then a transcription factor perturbation was performed and the graphs were produced to simulate how the cell identity changes using like vector values based on gene expression. And then the calculation of the perturbation score could also be done. So this would, oh, this was also with the gene expression values within the network. So from here, I'd like to tell you a bit more about my results. So first of all, I was able to rank some, uh, rank some of the genes within the network based on a variety of centrality scores. So the first of these rankings was degree centrality, which ranks the genes on the number of connections. So a higher number of nodes connected, so whether that's genes or transcription factors, would mean a higher score. So this basically just means that the gene regulates more of the other genes. So in this model, gene A would have a higher degree centrality than gene B because it has far more connections to other nodes. So in this score, the FOS gene was ranked as the highest, which means it has the highest number of nodes connected to it. So it regulates the most of the genes and uh, the genes and transcription factors. Another method was between this centrality, which ranks genes on their influence to pass to other genes. So in, for example, in this graph, gene A, going to, from gene A to gene C depends on gene B. So gene B would have a higher between this centrality because this path from these two genes is dependent on it. So in this measure, the KLF6 and PBX3 genes were ranked as the highest. So that means they have the most paths dependent on them. And these genes were also highly ranking in other centrality scores. The final method we used was eigenvector centrality, which basically ranks the genes on their influence in the network and how like sort of the importance of their connections. So they were connected to other high scoring nodes if they had a higher score. So in this case, you see gene A is connected to other like high scoring genes. So it would have a higher eigenvector centrality than gene B. And in this centrality ranking, we also got consistent results with FOS being ranked as the highest and PBX3 and KLF6 having high scores as well. And so from this data, uh, from this data I chose the FOS, gene, uh, the FOS gene to knock out. And so I'd first like to note that, that this graph is not entirely accurate given that, as you can see, all, there are a bunch of different colors, like all of these different colors in theory should represent a different cell state, but as you saw before, there were only like five B cell states, but there are over 30 of these different colors. So the parameters for how these uh, how the colors are clustered together will need to be improved in the future. But these, result, uh, but these results do have some relevance. So as you can see, each one of these points is a different vector, and each one of these points also represents a different cell. And it, and all of the cells are in like the different states then. So, and as you can see, there are large arrows here and the larger the arrow is, the more significant impact it's supposed to, it has on the cell identity. And this impact is calculated from the gene, and ex, the gene and transcription factor expression matrix that I mentioned before. So as you can see, for example, in this one, the these like orange red genes are moving more towards the green state, which demonstrates some state change based on the state change based on the gene knockout. So from these results, I came to the conclusions that in silico methods were somewhat effective in simulating the transcription factor perturbation and also in like ranking the importance of the genes. But there were some limitations, such as the inaccuracies of the graph that I mentioned before, and there were continued issues with processing the single cell RNA seq data into like correct graphs. And the highly ranked genes did demonstrate an impact on the overall network as pre uh, predicted, but further work would be needed to show more accurate cell state changes based on like a better clustering system. 
And so from this, we could move on to further directions, such as refining the current model to give more accurate clustering, and more accurate representations of cell state change. These results could be applied to prioritize the transcription factors in the B-cell network based on their importance as they were ranked. And further investigation could be per uh, performed to see the roles different transcription factors play in B-cells. All right. Um, I would like to thank my mentors, Swapna, uh, Dr. Adrishnu Das, Truvapak Chakraborty, Jingyu Fan who, for providing the data and all of the DAS lab. And for Hillman, I would like to thank Dr. Joseph Ayub, Dr. David Coase, um, everyone who helped coordinate the Compire Research Academy and all of my fellow Compire Research Academy students. And I'd also like to thank my family for supporting me. Yeah. Hi, fantastic talk, really, really cool work. Thank you. Um, I might have missed it, but can you talk about how you clustered, like what algorithm did you do and how did you determine how many clusters? So you said you got what, like 30 or something? But yeah, five. so the clustering, specifically like which gene, uh, so which like gene expressions were clustered together, there was like, I think it was based on the like Louvain algorithm and there was like a, a parameter that was input and we weren't able to like test this parameter that much. So it was more of like a default value used for that. Mm -hmm. So basically the clustering, like there was a parameter based on like how I think like exact the clustering would be. So like in theory, there should be like, in theory, this data is like more separated than it should be because like there might be like individual like gene expressions that are similar, but they're all within like the same cell state. But this one is having like each individual gene expression sort of like be together as a different group instead of how it's supposed to be. So yeah. I just wonder if you guys like tried hierarchical clustering yeah. and see see if you can get the five states. But yeah. I know it's probably a lot more nuanced. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's built in already. We just use the their own, but yeah, we can try hierarchical. Yeah. <laughs> really cool work. Thank you. A trivial question. How do you make that pretty graph? Um, are you talking about this one? It's pretty. Um, <laughs> so this was actually so all of the like data points. So all of these data points were like kind of put on the graph. But there's the I think it was the force atlas algorithm that basically groups all the similar colors together. But you will note on this graph, just because two colors are close to each other, it doesn't necessarily mean they're similar. It just like put them like, it just like puts them like that, like in a particular shape. So, so there were like all of these data points were created and then the vectors were also placed into like each cell based on how much the cell of the state changed. And then the force atlas, uh, the force atlas like algorithm created uh, this like shape of the graph overall. Yeah, that answers your question. Uh, I had a question too. So you mentioned there were issues with the single cell RNA data. Yeah. What if you just did this with the attack seek data? Would that be enough information? If um, not to try that? No, it wouldn't just because, so the program requires like both of the inputs because, so while you have the base gene regulatory network, it doesn't like, it's kind of like too general and it doesn't tell you all the genes that are actually expressed and you need the RNA seq data for that. So yeah, so it would be required to have like better processed RNA seq data for this. That would be an interesting idea though. I'm not sure maybe a different algorithm could use that, adjust the base gen. Okay. One more. One more yeah. 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 What programming language is this like? Um, so most of it's in Python. There was the ataxic pro uh, the ataxic processing was in R with Cicero. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I Thank you at the beginning for explaining, like from a general standpoint. And it, I think I missed a lot of the details, but um, some of the things you were describing in the middle about the way the different um, genes interact and like how they score them made me think that there could be an analog much like you did at the beginning to explaining it like by social media like maybe like it seemed like one of them sort of acts like an influencer and like you're knocking one out and like oh, yeah. how that changes the way things are interacting I think is kind yeah. of what you're describing. So if you're like 
if you're discussing something like the degree centrality, like in this case, you could, con- in the social media, like analogy, you could consider this like more of like an influencer. And then this is like, just like a regular person who might be like following the influencer. Like if you're, if you want to think about it that way. And then like, yeah, the other ones, this one doesn't have an exact like social media analog. This is probably easier to think about more like an airplane, like I, like the other one I mentioned before. So like you have to go for you have to go to this airport to get between these two. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's neat. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good idea. Great. Just thank you, Emma. Uh, is there anything I need to do? No, okay. Yeah, take care. <laughs> I don't want you to leave that. Go ahead and screen share. Okay. Okay, let's see if it'll come up. You can try to redo the share. Hmm. I think you put the whiteboard, yeah. Um. It's probably extending. Hey, Great. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Wong Yi. I work as a postdoc in the School of Pharmacy. It's my pleasure to introduce Oliver Adams. Um, he's a uh, uh, like a 10th year. Um, high school student, probably among the like youngest among you guys. And the project he helped in our lab is we have a drug lead that's targeting multiple myeloma, which is the blood uh, cancer. And thanks for Anna's introduction, this is also a type of B cell problem. So you might, you might know a little bit about B cell now. So what he does is we have uh, used a drug to treat the cells, and that uh, we did the RNA seq and Adam. Uh, Oliver helped us to analyze what's the pathways that's possibly making the drug effective against the cells. So, or yours? <clears throat> um, allow a bit of overlap here, but multiple myeloma is the second most common blood cancer, primarily characterized by its effect on plasma cells, a type of white blood cell. These plasma cells start to produce abnormal antibodies in your bone marrow, causing some irreparable bone damage, renal impairment, anemia, anything you don't find fun. So the main danger of multiple myeloma comes in its drug resistance. As with most cancers, myeloma cells tend to develop a drug resistance very rapidly. And it's especially dangerous because most of the current drugs to treat multiple myeloma all target the protozoan pathway. But unfortunately, once the cell develops a resistance in that pathway, then it becomes essentially incurable or at least much difficult to treat. So that's why our drug lead is targeting the autophagy pathway, or more specifically, the P62 protein in autophagy. Uh, autophagy is the cellular process that a cell utilizes to dispose of damage parts or parts in disrepair that the cell doesn't want anymore, essentially consuming them and recycling their parts to be utilized elsewhere. It is a vital component of drug resistance in multiple myeloma cells, and B62 specifically is an essential protein in the process. The goal of this entire project is to verify G25, the aforementioned drug lead mechanism of action. So preliminary research that we did in Dr. G's lab has told us that G25 aggregates P62. If you 
direct your attention to the handy graphic on the right is a Western blot depicting the amount of P6C2 aggregate versus a dose of G25. So at the top of the image, you can see the amount of P6C2 aggregate. And above that, you can see how much G25 was treated. So with zero micromolar of G25 or an untreated cell, it results in very little P6C2 aggregate. But as you steadily increase the dose, more and more P62 aggregate is being detected, essentially proving that the drug is responsible for the P62 aggregation. The second thing that we know is that it is effective at killing myeloma cells. So with 7.5 micromolar and 16 hours, you're essentially killing all myeloma cells. But the issue that we have is, other than those two points, the actual mechanism of action is largely unknown. So we know it aggregates P62, we know it kills the cells, but we don't know what happens in between those two points. That's why we are going to be using a technique called RNA sequencing. It's a technique to study the actual gene expression of the cells and quantify what gene has been activated by a cell and how often it has been can then use that data to better understand what exact inner mechanisms are going on within the cell. So you can see on the right the process. You first isolate the cell, extract the RNA, convert it into its complementary DNA, and then sequence all of the nucleotides in the DNA. So all of your A, T, Cs, and Gs you collect all of those and find out what genes have been activated. So there we developed this process. We treated myeloma cells with five and 7.5 micromolar doses of G25 and monitored its progress two hours, four hours, and eight hours after treatment of RNA sequencing. And then we used that gene expression data put it through a program called Ingenuity Pathway Analysis to define what actual biological pathways are being affected. Essentially, trying to translate all of these different genes into actual interpretable processes, which resulted in this. On the left here, you can see all the different processes that the program has detected. And, and then on the other three columns, you can find out how much more they were expressed compared to an untreated cell. So a darker shade of red would indicate that has been activated more, and a shade of green would indicate it's been expressed less, and white means it's similar to the control. The three different columns are there to signify two hours, four hours, and eight hours after treatment. So from this, we were able to discern three major points. First is that the cell is activating the autophagy pathway very rapidly after some time passes. So you can see at two hours, it is barely detectable, not very different compared to the control. But after four hours and eight hours, it starts to steadily increase. The second point that we found is that the cell survival signaling pathway increases initially, but decreases later. So very highly upregulated in two hours, four hours, but then decreases when going into eight hours. We interpret this, this to mean that the cell is activating some defensive mechanism to the drug and starts to upregulate that signaling pathway. But eventually the, some, the drug somehow overcomes that resistance between four and eight hours, causing it to drop back down. The third point that we made is that the unfolded protein response pathway is markedly upregulated throughout the whole process. This is in very essential pathway because it is what the autophagy pathway is trying to target, the unfolded proteins. So through all this data and a bit more points, we were able to create 
this basic model for G25's hypothesized mechanism of action. So first, G25 aggregates P62, which causes P62 to become a misfolded protein. And since P62 is an essential component in the autophagy process, it simultaneously impairs the capacity of autophagy. Then the cell has to activate the autophagy process to dispose of the misfolded proteins that have been built up from the aggregation of P62. And then the number of misfolded proteins can be measured by the unfolded protein response pathway. Within this model, we found three major things. First is that the autophagy pathway is very highly stressed out. Thanks to the aggregation of P62 impairing its capacity and its constant activation to deal with all the misfolded protein, it has become significantly weakened and is not able to effectively deal with all the misfolded protein. We know this by the mis by the unfolded protein response pathway being highly upregulated compared to the control. If the number of misfolded proteins were still under a manageable amount, it would be very similar to the control, but in this case is highly upregulated. Then we were able to learn that the misfolded proteins are likely the cause of death. If these proteins keep building up, then eventually the cell is most likely going to die. And lastly, the unfolded protein response pathway is able to signify the death of the cell. The next steps for our project will be to verify that the cell death is in fact induced by the misfolded protein, and further proving our previous conclusion. And then the second direction that we have to do is identify the actual proteins that are responsible in the unfolded protein response pathway so that we can know if the actual drug is targeting more than just B62 and what exactly it's doing to those other proteins. And lastly, I'd like to thank a few people. First, Dr. Guanyi Zhao, and I think B5 here, is my mentor and my guide throughout this arduous journey for these past seven weeks. Dr. Ji, the head of my lab at Pitt Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Dr. Joseph Ayub in A4. And a, the Hillman faculty. And lastly, Pitt Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Thank you. Questions? So you had mentioned that the drug in the um, T25 was, you said it was like, it was, it was useful, like stopping the process of being multiple myeloma, or like you said it was like an effective treatment, right? It effectively kills it. Yeah, effectively kills it. Do you have any like information on the on the like relapse rates after the treatment with the drug or like has there not been enough time for that or so far we've only been testing it on single cells ah. hopefully by the end of this year we can get patient samples but we don't have any of that yet oh oh all right so like you, you say drug uh aggregation of p62 do you have any hypothesis or evidence of like what's involved in in that like is the drug directly binding to p62 and causing aggregation or is it a downstream effect do you have any idea mm, i think it's directly binding to p62 i don't necessarily have the research behind me on that but i remember being told do you have any <laughs> yeah, that's, so, I, I can answer a question a little bit. So uh, this is like a second or third generation of the same analog of the drug name. So previously we have uh, been doing some like biotin pull down assays to, and also the truncation of the PCQ2 proteins to prove that it's, it's actually the PCQ really the way that the drug directly bind and induce the aggregation. Okay. Oh. 
how how did you perform the pathway analysis? Like, uh, how did you find the top pathways when you were presenting that? So slide, yeah, these analytical pathways. Like, how did you choose these? So first, I uh, tried to find the pathways that were the most significantly expressed. So aim has the most major changes compared to the control. Then kind of just trying to look through all the different pathways, find out some that might not be as important, such as a stress pathway, and try to or, and try to take them out of this list. Still use them in the actual results, but mm, mm, trying to filter out those, and there we have these 12. Did you see similar results with the five micromolar concentration? Mm, yes, we did. Okay. And I didn't want to just overload the slide, so yeah. <laughs> kind of kept it a bit small. That's good validation, too. Um, if I can ask a follow up question, too, this is maybe for you, but uh, in the aggregation study, the concentration was a lot higher. Right? We were up to 500 micromolar. Here we're at five and seven. Do you still see aggregation at the, uh, the lower, that 7.5 um, concentration, or is it just difficult to see in that experiment? Is that that's more a more question for your mentor. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a more like experimental settings. This is more like a sales free system. So we expressed the PCD2 and they were floating all around. We have to add a lot of that in uh -huh. there. But we do have aggregation assays with the cells, yeah. which uh, wasn't shown up here. Okay. So we proved that we have once we add five or seven point five micromolar of the drug, the aggregation can be seen in the cells. So usually the PCT is diffused within the cells. You can see a smear, but once you have the drug, they will be very bright both sides. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Questions for all? Yeah. So we'll take a quick break. Um, we'll stay till uh, top of the hour, so 11 o'clock. Uh, I'll get us back on schedule two. Uh, we'll come back with a little bit of uh, Cobra trivia, actually, and then uh, start with the rest of the program. So please help, please help yourself to the refreshments in the back, and uh, we'll see you. Soon. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, somebody mentioned that they couldn't hear or see. So, I hope uh, the online folks, are you with us? Can you hear us on there? I hope. What yeah, we can hear. Wonderful. Thank you. Minimize this. Uh, okay, so I'm and also trying a little bit of technology with this too. So. Uh, for those that have their cell phones with you, uh, you might need that or a computer too. Um, let's see. Sorry. Okay. So I had three questions about the, the history of our program, just to see uh, some fun facts here. So the first one is what's the most recent name of the CompBio Research Academy, COBRA? This is a more recent name. So if you just scan the QR code or go to this website with that and put that number in, uh, we'll see your results in real time here. So, Cisco Bio has a boat. Some might have insider information. G team, okay. No one for Cancer Crushers or BioForce yet. No? Huh. Maybe there was some inside information here. Team team, about 25% now. All right, anyone else for input here? Well, congratulations to those that figured out the Disco Bio. That was the name of the program initially, or uh, not initially, actually, before this. Uh, so that actually stood for Drug Discovery Systems and Computational Biology. Uh, I'm a sucker for bad acronyms, and that was one of them. Uh, <laughs> COBRA just landed itself in our laps, too, for Computational Biology Research Academy. Uh, gene Team is actually a program here at Pitt. Uh, there is a, a Gene Team uh, that does uh, research as well. The other two I just I just made up. Um, before Disco Bio, we were actually Cosby also. So the origin of Cosby 
well, some number of years ago, which we'll get to the next question. Uh, we were actually a joint program with the biomedical informatics department when they were closer to us here in Oakland. Uh, and also um, it was a smaller program too, when we started and we got too big and they moved across the uh, campus. So uh, we uh, might toast, as we say, into two different programs. Um, the showing the interest in, in this type of work too, which is great. Okay, question number two. In what year was the first Cobra, Cosby, Disco Bio, whatever name it's under, what was the first year that we, we offered? 1991, 2001, I guess it's moving, 2011 or 2021? Boy, you guys really studied well for this one, okay. One for 2001. We're still in graduate school. Okay, a couple 2021 more recent. 2011. Uh, so yeah, 20. You guys are good, man. 2011 uh, was the first year we did this. So we've been running this program for for a number of years now. Um, I think it keeps getting better and better. This has been a great uh, treat today for this symposium. Okay, last one. How many students have we trained in Cobra, roughly? 10, 50, 175, 150. So not in the whole Hillman Academy. That's a much different number. But uh, just within our site here in Compile. I think I may have gotten you on this one. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, wow, okay, yeah, the wisdom of the crowd uh, here has, has shifted and uh, gone to a more, yeah, the, the correct number. So I think we're about 96 or so, call it 100. Um, but yeah, we've been able to to reach uh, 100 uh, students just in, in our program here. I think the Hillman Academy overall, it's probably close to 600. I think it's over 600 now total students uh, that, that have been reached over the, the many years as this program has has grown and grown. So, uh, well, thank you for uh, acing this, this exam too. Um, and with that, we are going to uh, pick up the rest of the program. Uh, and I'm actually going to be introducing the, the next speaker. So uh, Henry, if you want to come up and start getting together here. I can turn this on. I gotta leave the meeting. Whoa. I'm just gonna leave this alone. I'm doing it. Whoa. There we are. Okay. We know what you're using. Oh, perfect. Right one. So one difference from the beginning of the program, and I didn't need reading glasses uh, at the beginning of the program, but uh, I sort of do now. So uh, Henry is a student. This is from uh, his mentors, um, Dr. Fung and Dr. Shi. Uh, Henry is a student from Bethel Park High School. He joined Dr. Fung's lab several weeks ago. During this time, Henry has been mainly focusing on AI-based antibody discovery. Uh, he is very impressed. Uh, this is Dr. Fung speaking by Henry's hard work and intelligence. I remember that when Henry reviewed a paper, he also attempted to create a one-page summary for it and discussed it with us. He showed great potential to be a successful scientist. Henry has worked with us to finish one antibody review paper, which we will submit by mid-August. That's awesome. Uh, he is also collaborating on another project with a PhD student, Tian Jin. Uh, they plan to finish this manuscript and submit it by the end of August. That's awesome, too. Uh, we have enjoyed the time that Henry has worked with us, and we will keep in touch for future collaborations. All right, thank you. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you about my project with Tangen, uh, testing, using, and modifying a fully computational protocol uh, for the design of antibodies. All right, so starting off with just what antibodies are. Um, so antibodies are Y-shaped proteins uh, produced by plasma B cells in the blood. B cells are a specific type of, type of white blood cells. A lot of other people talked about them already. Um, so antibodies recognize specific antigens uh, and trigger an immune response. Um, they're made up of two light chains and two heavy chains linked together by different kinds of bonds. Uh, one kind of bond is thisulfide bonds. 
Um, and colored in yellow here, um, you can see are the, the variable domains of the antibodies, um, uh, which contain complementary determining regions or CDRs. Uh, which drastically affect binding affinity. Um, and as we're we're designing antibodies for uh, for drugs, um, this is mostly the region that we take a look at um, because we hope to increase that binding affinity. The binding affinity is how strongly the antibodies bind to their antigens, um, and we want to increase that while keeping the human characteristics of the antibodies um, and keep the antibodies from doing things like binding to each other. So therapeutic antibodies. So already over 100 monoclonal antibodies have been approved. Uh, monoclonal antibodies are antibodies designed in the lab to target a specific antigen. Antibodies gained a lot of their popularity uh, for, for drugs um, over, the, over the pandemic. Um, they, were, they were shown to be effective for testing and treating the virus. Um, and as you can see in this figure, um, this is one way that antibodies can work. Um, they, they bind to the, the binding site of a virus or a pathogen um, and keep it from binding to the, to the cell and proliferating. Um, and of these 100 monoclonal antibodies that have been approved, um, they, uh, there are treatments for autoimmune diseases, cancers, uh, Alzheimer's, and even drug abuse. So some past and present approaches for designing antibodies. Um, so we have lab techniques, and then we have these new computational tools also. Um, so these Lab techniques are still used. Um, typically now they're used after some computational tools are used uh, because these lab techniques are, are uh, slow and expensive. Um, and these computational tools, uh, the accuracy is improving and they're free and easy to use. Um, and also a lot of other projects talked about AlphaFold. AlphaFold isn't a program that I actually use specifically on my in my research. Um, but it, it's able, it, it uses machine learning algorithms to very accurately uh, predict uh, protein structure. You can see here, um, AlphaFold is it, the predicted protein structure with AlphaFold is colored in blue um, and the experimental, experimentally validated structure is colored in green. All right, so my research question uh, was, can we use these new computational tools and combine them in such a way um, that results in efficient and effective antibody design? So to take a look at that, we looked at two different antibodies. Uh, the first was semiplumab, um, which uh, semiplumab's antigen is PD-1, or program cell death receptor 1, uh, which is involved in regulating the pathway of a specific type of non-melanoma skin cancer. Um, and then the other one that we took a look at was teropavimab, uh, which uh, teropavimab's antigen is GP-120, uh, which is the, the uh, receptor uh, on HIV. Um, so terapavimab works similarly to how the, the antibodies worked in the figure I showed on the previously slide, previous slide. Um, it, it, it keeps the uh, HIV from fusing and, and entering into the cell. Um, and as I mentioned before, antibodies have a heavy chain, a light chain. Um, the heavy chain here is colored in green. Uh, the light chain's in blue and the uh, antigens for both complexes are colored in pink. All right, so our protocol for uh, redesigning uh, these antibodies. Um, so broadly, uh, what we do, uh, ignoring, I'll go into all the steps, but broadly what we do is we take in an antibody sequence uh, that an, of an antibody that already exists. And as output, um, we get a mutated antibody that hopefully has uh, better characteristics to be used as a drug. So to get the antibody uh, sequence, uh, we get that from IMGT, which is a database containing lots of uh, antibody sequences. Um, and from there, uh, we look on PDB or protein database to see if the structure of the antibody is known. Um, and if it's not known, then we perform homology modeling uh, of the antibody using a program called Swiss model. What homology modeling is, uh, is it basically takes uh, antibodies with similar sequences and looks at how they fold and the structure they form um, and tries to predict how our antibody that we're taking a look at will, will fold. After that, uh, we use a, a Rosetta protocol for structure relaxation. Uh, all that means is it makes the antibody closer to its native state. From there, we also look to PDB to see if there's binding information known about the antibody and the antigen. Um, so on PDB, if the binding information is known, there's likely uh, 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 something on PDB that has the entire complex. Um, but if it doesn't, uh, then we need to perform an extra docking step. Uh, so first we perform global docking using Plus Pro, which just uses general rules um, to predict the, the way the antibody will bind to the antigen. 
And then from there, uh, we use more specific binding called local, uh, uh, we perform local docking, which is just more specific docking using different algorithms um, that builds off of the, the Clust Pro prediction uh, using SnugDoc, which is another Rosetta uh, software. From there, um, we use a handful of machine learning algorithms made by my lab. Um, so the first of which uh, we predict the interface, or, uh, we determine the interface residues. Um, all that means, so residues, proteins are made up of amino acids. Another way to refer to those amino acids inside the protein are residues. Um, and the, the interface residues are the residues that affect the binding to the antigen. Um, so using a machine learning algorithm, uh, we uh, determine the interface residues. And from there, we use another uh, uh, algorithm to predict the mutations. So point mutations are just mutating specific um, specific amino acids in the uh, antibody um, that hopefully results in, in better characteristics. And that's our output is a mutated antibody sequence. All right, so uh, I mentioned all the, the modeling of the antibody um, and, and uh, getting the sequence and all the steps before that. Um, but well, there's not much data to present there, so I'm going to jump into the, the docking steps. Um, so this before, this is the, the global docking using Clust Pro, uh, which is a software developed at BU. Um, and what we did here is we passed in uh, information of the antibody and the antigen, and it predicts, uh, predicts different ways that the antigen and the antibody bind. Um, so from here, we used the one with the lowest score, which shows the, the strongest binding affinity and the most likely way that the, the antibody and the antigen uh, bind. Um, and as you can see, both scores here are actually uh, the lowest for, for the first cluster. So then using those results from the global doc and using Clust Pro, uh, we pass those results into SnugDoc, um, which gives us more specific uh, a more specific docking result. Uh, so this graph is is an output from the snug doc results. Um, here on the left, uh, we see the interface score. So we want the lowest interface score, which shows the, the strongest binding. Uh, and the root mean standard deviation here shows the accuracy of the results. So it uses the global docking from Clust Pro um, to, to overlay the structures predicted from snug doc and, and predict how much those vary. So uh, what we look for is this, the um, the results, the docking results with the lowest lowest interface scores, um, which show the strongest binding, um, but they also need to be accurate. Um, so we also need them to have a low root mean standard deviation. So we look for, uh, these are our top 10 scores down here, and they also have a low root mean standard deviation. So this local docking step was a success. Um, and the, all of the data I've presented so far is for the one antibody, semiflumab, um, teropavimab, failed at this step um, because it had low interface scores, but its root mean standard deviation was too high. Um, it was above, we looked for it to be below four um, for the top 10 high scores, and it was much higher than that. Um, so we need to find better binding information in the global docking step for teropapamab. So then uh, using the, the code developed in my lab, um, we determined the interface residues, um, and it was just these seven residues that had the biggest impact. Um, and this this image is also generated using PyMol, um, and you can see the the specific um, atoms of the the interface residues are are highlighted in pink here, and you can see they're close. This is still the uh, antigen, and this is the antibody, and you can see how the um, the interface residues are typically located very close to the antigen. All right, so then in the next step, using the code, um, we predicted the mutations. Uh, again, we're looking for the lowest score here, which shows an increase in, in binding affinity. Um, so uh, we passed the interface residues into this program, um, and it predicted all of the different possible mutations. And this is the output of the mutations that show the, the lowest score, which shows the biggest increase in binding affinity. This is the specific residue, uh, and these are just abbreviations of uh, uh, amino acids that we're mutating to. All right, so next steps, uh, the semiplumab went well. Um, so we're gonna uh, pass those mutations on to uh, some of those mutations onto a molecular dynamic simulation to see how uh, the newly mutated antibody uh, acts in a the cellular environment. And then based on that simulation, we'll decide um, which ones we, uh, hopefully we find one that, that works well and has uh, better characteristics that uh, can be tested in the lab. 
And then with terapavimab, we just need to retrace our steps and find where the, the problem occurred um, and, and uh, go back through that one. So in future directions for the field as a whole. So as these computational approaches get better, um, the drug discovery will be more streamlined. Um, and as there are, are more ways to kind of connect connect the, the, um, the, the computational tools that already exist, um, that will also make the process go more smoothly. All right, so some acknowledgements. Uh, thank you to Tanjan Liang and Dr. Ziwei Feng. Um, they were my mentors through this uh, and they helped a lot. Um, Dr. Jie was the PI of my lab um, and all the other lab members were helpful in, in generating my data. Um, Neil was the my, my tech bio mentor and we had some good conversations about both of our research, kind of helped me to understand what I was doing more and, and understand some other cool stuff, science stuff. Um, thank you to all of the COBRA uh, people running COBRA. Um, it was a really cool program. I was glad to be a part of it. Uh, thank you to the Hillman people for um, people that run Hillman for giving me this opportunity. And thank you to the other students uh, and speakers and my family. All right. Thank you. So if I understood correctly, the RMSD was to the plus pro docking. So the, the, the team probably thought, you know, by failed. That's basically saying, was that a in class pro have different ideas of how it should bind? Yes. Um, so class pro and the snug doc uh, function, they, they, they use different algorithms um, and they don't always line up. So we tried to redo the class pro um, and it still wasn't working in snug doc. Um, but yeah, that's basically what it's what it's saying. So there the, wasn't even a different model on the plus pro list that asked the snug dogs preferred finding. Um, so not with a low enough score, if that makes sense. Yeah. And the mutation that had the lowest, one of the you know, the, the, the most uh, uh, well, you know, the best uh, mutation. It was an H to H in your list. Okay. Um. Yeah. So, so here, here on the. Yes. Yeah, um. So this is at on the on the residue. This is the this is the chain. Um. So that's just saying the heavy chain position at fifty three. Um. Is mutating to H, which is an abbreviation for amino acid. Do you have a, a where that is on the um your map? Um. So heavy chain is the green. Um. So it is it's somewhere. Somewhere in this area right here. <laughs> so you're only getting single amino acid mutations, right, from the, for the output. Um, you, will you test multiple like combinations of these? Is that viable, you think, or just single? Uh, yes, uh, we might try combinations. Uh, we'll probably start with trying singles, um, just because it's it throws a lot of things off if you try too many at once. If that makes sense. Um, so yeah, we'll go try. We after after we went through this and we found all of the predicted mutations, we used Pymol um, to look at the hydrogen bonding and how the, the hydrogen bonding changed, um, so that we can narrow down the what we wanted to pass into the molecular dynamic simulations. Um, so then we will try a couple specific point mutations next. We should be able to just more screen sharing real far. I think it's loading. Your Wi Fi is so connected. Yeah, apparently. 
of labor at Heights Yeah. Okay. I have to say that this has been the most number of uh, questions from family members I think we've ever gotten uh, in many of these sessions. So kudos to the audience. Nasty job. Keep it up. I lost a lot. <laughs> Do you want to try and present on that? Sure. Just pull that up and be easier. Your presentation at all? Hopefully not. There are a lot of data screen shares. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Tyler Lovelace. I'm a PhD student here in the Venice lab, and it is my honor to introduce Neil Forwall. Uh, it's actually my second year working with him. He's done a great job both years. Um, this year, I asked him to look into using the probabilistic graphical models developed in our lab to identify transcriptomic and clinical signatures. Uh, related to all cause mortality in moderate to severe to P. Um, I asked Neil to work through basically an entire uh, project pipeline from like the original raw account data all the way up to a working picked model. Uh, so I asked a lot from him and I uh, threw a lot of different packages and tools at him. And Neil did a great job of learning all that information and turning it into a cohesive final project. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce you. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Neil, and my project over the summer was probabilistic graphical models identify transcriptomic and clinical markers of all-cause mortality in moderate to severe COPD. COPD stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It is the third leading cause of death worldwide, and it is generally classified as a persistent airflow obstruction that causes limited breathing. If you look on the right, you can see a healthy lung versus a patient that has COPD. One of the main differences are the obstructed bronchial tubes, as you can see right here, and the uh, deteriorated, deteriorated alveoli. So we use causal probabilistic graphical models in order to find these transcriptomic and clinical markers. So these are models that determine how different variables are related and tries to uh, figure out how they affect each other. So for example, if you have the following network of nodes of different variables and you wanted to discern what specifically affects a person's current height, you could run a causal probabilistic graphical model and you would hope to achieve something like this where, a parent's, where your parent's height as well as your age affects your current height, as well as any other relationships that the model discerns. So identifying these transcriptomic and clinical markers leads to tailored patient care because more information is known about the patient's timeline as well as helps with early detection and intervention of high-risk COPD patients through marker screening. And then most importantly, it helps enhance precision medicine by targeting specific molecular or clinical factors in COPD prognosis. So the question in my project, there was two questions my project sought to, to, sought to answer. One being, can probabilistic graphical models effectively identify transcriptomic and clinical markers associated with COPD mortality in patients with moderate to severe COPD. And the second question was, okay, uh, can these markers serve as reliable predictors of mortality risk? So this is just the overall pipeline that we use to figure out the transcriptomic and clinical markers. And uh, first off, we started with a data set of COPD gene participants. These were all people with moderate to severe COPD, uh, moderate, moderately severe and severe COPD. And they were also all smokers with RNA sequencing data. So first off, we started with getting the 500 most variative genes. 
So the 500 morse variety of genes were extracted using hierarchical and gene clustering, as well as single and average linkage. So this essentially just narrows down the number of predictors in our model to make it run quicker. After we get the 500 most variable genes, um, after we get the 500 most variable genes, we filter through the data, normalize it, and prepare it to for the models to actually run upon. So first off, we start off with DE-seq to normalization uh, on the raw bulk RNA sequencing counts, and this essentially make sure that no expressed genes dominate the more subtle genes in order to make sure that we uh, preserve genes that may be potentially biologically significant and actually affect COPD mortality. After we, uh, after we normalize the data, we use combat batch correction to remove technical sources of noise. So these are uh, variability created by the different instruments used in collection. So if you look on the left, you can see these um, two different clusters, which signal two different methods of collection. And in order to adequately compare both of these gene counts uh, from the two different places, you must uh, apply the batch correction in order to make it so that the data can be compared. After the batch effects were removed, we renormalized the data, uh, which prepared it to be run, which pre prepared it for the models to be run on. So after uh, we renormalized the data and removed the technical sources of variation. We applied instaprism deconvolution, which estimates cell type composition from the bulk RNA sequencing counts. These serve as additional predictors of the model. These are like uh, the cell type proportions of different uh, immune cells that were released uh, in patients when they were fighting COPD. So once we've prepared the data for the model, we can perform a tenfold cross-validation. Uh, so tenfold cross-validation splits the COPD data set into 10 equal folds by randomly assigning each sample to one of the folds. So it looks as following, where you have 10 different data sets broken up into 10 segments, and each of the segment for the 10 different data sets uh, corresponds to a different testing uh, test, test segment and training segments. And this overall helps us understand how the model performs uh, on unseen data, as well as helps generalize the results. After we have successfully split the data into our 10 folds, we can apply both of the probabilistic graphical models that we use to figure out the clinical and transcriptomic markers associated with COPD mortality called the mixed graphical model, as well as the PC stable model. So the mixed graphical model uh, learns an undirected graph skeleton for representing relationships between variables. So this is kind of like a rough draft of an essay where you kind of know where you're going, you have a couple of different paths, uh, but you don't exactly have a final idea of where you want to take it. And this was the initial skeleton graph, as you can see with the different nodes, with these edges representing undirected edges, which just mean that these variables could either affect each other, uh, one could affect the other, or vice versa. And these are just the different variables. The variable we're trying to predict is the overall variable, which represents the amount of time till either the study lost track of the patients or the patients died. So after we ran the mixed graphical model to get the skeleton structure, we applied a PC stable model, which orients those edges and narrows down the relationships discovered by the MGM model. Uh, so this is more of your final copy of your essay. And then we also implemented known relationships in order to make the model not only run faster, but also make sure that it, they focus on the unknown relationships instead of uh, ones that are already known. One of these relationships includes something like the duration smoking affecting lung capacity. Um, okay. There's supposed to be a slide with the PC stable. Um, graph, I guess it didn't translate. All right, so once we had the actual nodes, we checked the accuracy of, uh, of our model. So this was done using a concordance, which essentially pairs our prediction and our outcome, and it takes the proportion of, um, proportion of uh, pairs that correctly predicted the outcome. So for this example, 
dead dead and alive live get you a concordance of 0.5 so this was how um this is how our model performed with different stabilization methods up here and then the different false discovery rates which just determine how much variable uh how many uh connections our graph can make as well as how many connections can be wrong so a concordance of 0.5 essentially indicates a random model so our model performs well above um random with a concordance or accuracy of about 0.7 the model that performed the best was the step uh, model with the steps stabilization method which performed at 0.72 ish so after we um check the accuracy of our model we can get the transcriptomic and clinical markers associated with copd mortality risk so this was the oriented PC stable model, and it has four different variables connected to the overall variable, including whether or not the patient had cardiovascular disease and the severity, uh, the age at their visit in the study, the distance they could walk in six minutes, as well as a gene PTPR kit. So once we had those clinical markers, transcriptomic and clinical markers, we were able to apply a Cox proportional hazards model, which is used to predict the rate of mortality. So it uses the markers in order to predict the hazard ratios. Hazard ratios are the relative risk of experiencing COPD related death due to different levels of the markers. So different levels of cardiovascular disease, how far they could walk or their age. So these were the hazard ratios for the markers. Um, so for CVD, it had hazard ratios of a 1.27. Anything above one means higher levels lead to increased sleep, increased risk of death. And then um, for lower levels, like distance walk, for um, lower hazard ratios, like distance walked and PTPRK, higher levels of uh, distance walked and PTPRK lead to decreased mortality, which makes sense because people that are healthier uh, can generally fight diseases better than those who can't. So this was a comparison of um, our model versus the Bode index. So on the bottom, we have time, which is in days, as well as the survival probability as the patient moves along. And then these are the different um, uh, categories of severity. And then this was our model. Our model performed re relatively identical to the existing model. However, it performed um, about well, had an accuracy of 0.2 higher, which is not statistically significant, though it did perform better. So conclusions, uh, transcriptomic and clinical markers associated with COVD were successfully recovered, as well as those markers were successful uh, to predict mortality risk of COPD patients. And future work would include uh, external validation using independent cohorts of diverse COPD patients. Our data set was only smokers. Uh, and then prediction of specific patient outcomes like disease ex exacerbations or hospitalizations, which will give doctors and patients more info about their current situations. I would like to thank my mentor, Tyler, uh, who's been great over the past two years, as well as Dr. Benos for allowing me into his lab. I thank uh, Dr. Ayub as well as Dr. Coase for sponsoring this. Uh, Cobra Academy, as well as Emily for helping out with my key card and all of my other stuff. <laughs> and then I like to thank Dr. Boone and Stephen for uh, at the Hillman Academy. Questions? Yes. This is very great work and good job explaining the whole process. That was very helpful. I guess I'm curious, sort of like big picture, right? Like you're yeah. able to predict mortality, but in some sense, then what what will that be used for? I don't know if you so, it, like it could be yeah. for sort of good or evil. <laughs> <laughs> So if you like know when a patient's going to die, like this happens more on the doctor's side where they can ramp up treatments, maybe start doing like, experimental if they don't have much time left. Um, but it just gives the patients more information and the doctors more information on the approaches they want to take to saving the patient's life. They might take a higher risk intervention. Yes, based on how much, yeah. 
How many CPU hours do you think you used on that button? Um, so the first time we ran, we ran like all gold, gold stages. So this was the whole data set. Uh, and it like cut off at seven days. And then probably like, honestly, like a week or two. And it boiled down to five. Five, yeah. What do you know about that gene? Um, I think it's involved in um having on my other slides that aren't on this. Mm -hmm. That came from my Wi-Fi sign. Um, I think it's it's like the phosphate pyrosine PTP. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the, and I think it helps it's yeah, I don't remember. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Well, do you remember? So I don't know exactly what role is playing in this case, but um, it's necessary for T cell maturation. and also plays a role in um, cell cell lipase. Um, since this is full lipase expression, it's probably a little bit of different meat functions. But I can see the results again. I yeah. remember very fast. No, 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 forward the, the, the survival one. one. Yeah. Which one is yours? Uh, the one on the right. Oh, okay. okay. Any other questions here? Most of them, slide up the words. Uh, so, distance walk was an important predictor. Yeah. Was that taken contemporaneously like, at the same time as the like when when was that in there sort of the course of the teams? Uh so whenever the patient came in for the check-in during the study, that was when they measured it. So all these variables are measured at the baseline, except for the formality. You're right on time too, right? You're already on the same, right? Um, then I first decided to make a video for this program. I was wondering what kind of project I could this student going after everyone's doing this. And I saw Ian's resume and I saw your different equations. I was like, okay, we should be fine. So, <laughs> gave him a pretty tough project on working on a optimized and model and he's sped it up many fold and done some interesting investigations. So, definitely look forward to seeing what he does next other than still in the job. So it's just really done fantastically. Thank you. Okay, so this summer I've been working on um, re-implementing a previous model that my lab had developed, um, looking at how actin and myosin interact in the cellular cortex, and also some methods to analyze that. So our primary motivation um, for this is that um, if forces are generated um, incorrectly within tissues, um, that can result in birth defects. And we want to know more about um, kind of how forces are generated so that um, we can understand how those birth defects occur. Um, okay. So, this figure um, is showing how um, in fruit fly embryos that um, structures at the bottom here um, in the embryo are determined by um, the types of tensions that are experienced um, by certain portions of the tissue. So on the left here in this resistance picture, um, that's an anisotropic 
conditions. Um, and that means that um, the force is the force on the tissue is higher um, on the, in the left right direction than on the um, kind of uh, top bottom direction. And that results in this stretching and um, this type of cortex mechanics. And that results in this um, sort of elongated structure of that part of the tissue. Whereas under isotropic conditions, which is when the forces are even and one of them is not larger than the other, um, you result in this kind of um, kind of sort of ring-shaped pattern of the cortex, um, and that results in um, the structure kind of folding in on itself um, rather than elongating. So we're talking about in terms of um, the epithelial cortex, and the cortex is essentially um, it's a a sort of skeleton inside the membrane um, that allows for the cell to um, have a certain shape and change that shape as well as produ to produce forces. Um, so this is kind of uh, a 2D simplification um, that is um, made in the model. Um, and it's primarily made of myosin, um, which is a motor protein, and actin. Um, so here are some Rubin diagrams of portions of those proteins. Um, and so it's easy to think of um, the cortex here as being kind of static and um, non-moving, but part of what helps it to generate force is actually the ability to be dy dynamic um, and kind of move around um, when it's experiencing certain conditions. Okay, so the central question of this research was how do how does the organization of the cortex um, affect that the force affect the force that it's able to produce? Um, so to answer that question, um, we used a computational model um, that had been previously developed, um, where um, so this figure shows. Um, two actin filaments in uh, magenta, which are polar, so they have a minus and plus end, and a motor that connects between them and kind of sort of walks towards the plus end. Um, and the motor also acts as a spring. So when it moves towards the plus, plus end, it exerts a torque um, and um, allows the plus ends to move closer to each other. And this is um, essentially the underlying um, sort of principle behind a lot of the mechanics that we see in the model. Um, additionally, the model includes um, springs along the edges, which attach the plus ends of the actin filaments. Um, and that allows us to simulate um, the boundary tensions that we're looking at in vivo. Um, and also allow us to take measurements on how the cortex is responding. So here's an animation of that. Okay, so that was the previous model. Um, and the new model works in the same way, except um, we improved the performance by around seven times and also um, changed the, the organization of how the model is um, programmed. So in the previous model, um, it consisted of essentially a spreadsheet where there are attributes of filaments and motors, and filament and motor motors essentially act as um, they just files of um, the lists of attributes. Um, so things like position or um, the attachments to um, from filaments to motors um, and how those change over time, as well as top level parameters. So things like viscosity. Um, but in the new model, um, there's a top level um, model object which contains the parameters as well as um, the ability to um, house multiple cortexes. So um, this work that we did um, particularly focused on um, single cell dynamics for now, um, but it has 
the ability to be expandable and work be um, multicellular. Um, the cortex has its own parameters, as well as lists of filaments and motors, which have their own attributes. Um, so this new model kind of makes it more easy to answer diverse questions um, because it's able to um, be kind of shift it around and modularly changed. Whereas the previous model was more um, was more static, it was more difficult to change things. All right. So another part of the work that I did um, was in trying to develop a uh, method for analyzing um, the outputs of these simulations. So um, here are um, two pictures of different stages of the cortex, um, where the magenta is the actin filaments and the some sort of cyan color is um, the myosin. And on the left, you see a ring structure, and we're interested in that because it tends to um, produce force. Whereas um, on the left, there's um, an aster, um, and the aster um, is organized um, more centrally. Um, so it, um, it doesn't typically produce as much force. Um, so in order to determine um, and kind of analyze these rings and asters, um, we wanted to take away the, the actin, so we could just see the ring and the aster with the myosin, um, and then find the densities um, of myosin at different points um, along the cortex. And then we can find the center point of that dense region and project a line outwards from that. Um, and along that line, um, it's just um, the um, density along that line is on the left here. Um, so you can see that in around um, one micrometer from the center, there is a peak and density um where um the ring is and then if we take um multiple slices able to determine um the average of those slices um to look at the overall structure and then over time as that changes um you can see how um the cortical structure shifts from being a ring shape to being more of an aster. Um, so on the density map on the left, um, it goes from um, having a peak away from the center point to having a peak at the center point. Um, so additionally, um, with the model, um, we also used um, the model, the new model also made it easier to do um, certain um to do certain simulations where um multiple parameters are being varied at the same time um so in this case um we're looking at um so these radial maps are of um the directional force produced by um by the by the cortex um under the and different anisotropic conditions um which is on the y-axis here. So um, we have a low and a high in isotropy, as well as um, filament length is also varied. Um, so you can see here that um, as filament length increases, um, it looks like the, the magnitude of force increases, as well as the kind of polarization of the force. Um, and then under, um, we also did, we did a similar um, test using maximum motor stretch length um, and saw that um, the maximum polarization and magnitude of force produced by the cortex um, uh, came from a, an intermediate 
um, maximum motor strength actually. Okay, so in summary, um, this project worked on re-implementing um, the lab's previous model of actin myosin dynamics um, to improve the performance and modularity of that model, as well as developing a method to analyze and localize um, certain um, actomyosin structures, as well as um, uh, an, a certain, an application of that model um, to um, varying several parameters at the same time, which had not been done previously. So next is um, tracking changes in the cortex morphology over time. So we've looked at um, kind of how um, like at a single time step, you can now with this analysis um, method, um, you can see um, whether something is a ring or an aster, but determining um, at what stage of in between it is at each time step and kind of how that changes over time um, could be something that could be explored in the future, as well as um, performing additional um, simulations with other varied parameters. Um, so changing um, other anisotropies or um, certain other model parameters could result in other results um, that might be easier with the simulation, as well as um, building upon the single cell model that was explored here um, to get to more tissue level simulations of um, the cortex. So I'd like to thank my mentors, Summer, who's helped me through this project and answered some of my questions and guided me along, as well as um, Dr. Lance Davidson, who runs the lab, um, and the um, CompBio leadership, as well as um, my fellow CompBio students, um, Hillman um, leadership, my biology teacher, Dr. K, and my parents. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Are there any questions? Great, great talk, Ian. Um, I was really curious of the amount of force produced by short film was much lower. Um, is that because there are fewer numbers? I mean, that sort of fewer net mass of actin filaments in the simulation, or is that special to just the length that, you know, if you increase the mass to match the long filament mass, would you see a change in the force production? Um, I think the um, the lengths of the, the filaments um, play a role in the connectivity of the cortex. Um, so I think, um, the majority of the reason why you see a lower force there is because um, the filaments have a harder time connecting to each other. Um, so the force produced and kind of transmitted through the cortex is much lower. So you mentioned in the new model that you can add multiple cortexes. So how big of a structure can you get in there? How scalable is, is the model going to be? Um, I haven't done a lot of um, testing with multiple cortexes yet, um, but it has the ability to extend to um, larger um, models. I think it's um, going to be mo more, most useful in um, kind of lower scale multicellular models, so four cell or eight cell kind of models. Um, probably not things that are too much bigger than that. How long does one simulation not take? Um, it depends on the computer and what I'm also running at the same time. Um, but it typically takes anywhere between kind of 25 seconds to 35 seconds. So you're not on meal uh, scale time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Seven days, that's like a <laughs>
uh, all, all your uh, animation pictures were 2D, Is the model 2D, or? Yes, so yeah, the model is 2D. Do you think you could make it 3D? Um, Next summer. <laughs> I think it would be doable. Um, I'm not sure about what else, what other information that would give me, but that would be an interesting uh, extra There's step. not a whole lot of cells that are two dimensional. Vast <laughs> <laughs> ensemble of people, though, they're all two dimensional. Yeah, it's uh, kind of see it that way. Awesome. Any other questions for, for Ian? Did you implement it? I implemented the new um, code in Julia, um, which um, tends to be quite a bit faster than that. Thank you, Ian, again. Yeah. Uh, let's give a round of applause for all the prisoners today. Uh, uh, so I think at this point, we're going to have a, a small lunch. So uh, you're welcome to stay and, and grab some food. Uh, I'll be here to answer questions about the program or take comments too. Uh, we'd love to, you know, get, get our feedback on, on the program. Uh, there's, a, again, the symposium at the Hillman starts at two o'clock. There's a shuttle for the students to get over there. We'll check out that out during lunch. Uh, but everyone else is, is also welcome to the assembly building at 5,000 Long Boulevard for the closing ceremony uh, as well. Thanks to everyone for coming. And yeah, happy to.